Penny of Britannica, and we run the tours here at Paddock. We are a society formed in 1974 for the uh, research, study and exploration of man-made and man-used underground spaces, anything from drains to mines to railway tunnels to bunkers. Um, we've got 900 members, and we've got a very uh, a huge website, and we've also got some leaflets upstairs. So if anyone uh, is interested in finding out more about Paddock, about Subrit, uh, then please ask for one of our leaflets uh, when we go out. Now before we start the tour, I have some uh, safety uh, details that I have to read out to comply with our health and safety licence to bring you down here. I brought the wrong glasses along today, these don't really suit me, but uh, I'll do my best with these. Right, you've all been provided with a hard hat. These must be worn at all times, and it's a condition of you joining the tour that you wear your hat. If you're unwilling to wear a hard hat, then one of my fellow guides uh, will escort you very roughly to the surface. <laughs> Eating, drinking, smoking and sex are not permitted at any time during the tour. Uh, the floor of the bunker is wet and uneven in places. Please watch where you're walking and take care using the stairs. Please hold on to the handrails at all times. If you suffer from any medical conditions such as claustrophobia, epilepsy, asthma, high blood pressure and hypoglycemia or are prone to fits or fainting, please let one of the guides know before we start the tour. Please don't leave the main tour and wander off on your own. Many of the rooms have debris on the floor and are not to be entered. Please don't cross any of the hazard tapes. That's an example of hazard tape across the door. There's nothing in any of the rooms, so those rooms aren't worth seeing anyway. A guide will be at the rear of the party at all times. Throughout the bunker there's extensive mould growth. This is perfectly safe, but we ask that you don't touch any mould or fungus. Please also don't touch any of these stalactites. You'll see some of them there. Uh, that hang from the ceiling as these will break off easily. They're very pretty and it'd be nice if we could keep them for other people to see in the future. No rats or other nasty things in the bunker, apart from Ian, somewhere. You <laughs> said that before as well. Well, no, it must be true then, <laughs> must be. it must be true. Uh, Firefighting uh, equipment is located at entry level and at each end of each corridor on both uh, the lower levels. In the event of an emergency evacuation, or if we're unable to use the main stairs for some reason, please follow the instructions of the guides who will lead you out via an emergency exit located at the south end of the bunker, last entrance on the right uh, down that side. Should you feel unwell or decide you don't wish to continue with the tour at any point, please ask one of the guides for assistance and we'll take you out. The tour involves using narrow spiral staircases. If anyone is unable to use these stairs or would prefer to use the main staircase between the floors, please ask one of the guides for assistance. Those with small children or a mobility problem must use the, uh, mustn't use the spiral stairs. Please ask a guide for assistance and we'll take you down the main stairway. At the end of the tour, please return all wristbands uh, so that you can be safely accounted for. The tour will last approximately 50 minutes and then there will be opportunities to ask questions and you can ask questions uh, throughout the tour as well. Right, where are we? Take a look at this picture. This is where we are. This is the post office research station uh, built in the 1930s uh, by the post office, uh, now taken here, uh, especially with uh, coding machines uh, during World War II, before World War II. Um, this particular bunker was built within the post office research station. It's this building here. The surface part of the building has now gone. It was a three-storey building, one storey above ground and the other two storeys below ground. So this is now housing, that's Brook Road there, uh, and we've just maintained, you see a little bit of a block there on one side fronting onto Brook Road, that's the little bit that's been retained. There's new brickwork in front of it, so it looks like a new building. It is, in fact, an old building. Nobody on this side can see it. On the other side, we can't see it at all. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it here. Ian will hold it up as you walk past, <laughs> and you can all take a look at it. Um, right, uh, we'll take, uh, take a start on the tour now. Um, first room we're going to take a look at is the ventilation plant room, which is at the end of the corridor. There's two plant rooms at the end of the corridor. Uh, there might be uh, a bomb, but more than likely there would have been a gas attack. Uh, the Germans were quite partial uh, to uh, various gases. They had tavern and they had mustard gas. We had mustard gas as well, but we uh, didn't use it as, as much as they did. 
Um, so the bunker had to be able to be uh, maintained in use with uh, a good supply of air. Now the only supply of air came from the outside, they can't make it, uh, so it had to be sucked in, it was brought in through this trunking here from the surface, uh, through that fan which blows it through, or sucks it through, in, and pushes it out into the trunking, into this unit here. This is uh, an air strut filters, and if you open that little door, you can see through there uh, the filter units, so the air is pushed through the filters and scrubbers, all the contaminants are cleaned out, and it's fed back into the trunking, which goes round, and you see the trunking there going through the walls, and uh, that metal trunking uh, takes a supply of fresh, clean air into all the rooms throughout the bunker. All this dates from 1939, when the bunker was built. Uh, that cabinet there is a control cabinet, it's a bit rusty now, uh, but in there there's a load of switches, relays, uh, and all the uh, plant in this room uh, would have been controlled from that cabinet there. A couple of uh, compressors here and uh, a couple of uh, pumps in there, that room there. Right, if you'd like to move out of the room to your right and diagonally across uh, into another plant room on the opposite side of the corridor. So turn right as you come out of the room and then diagonally across. How is it powered? No heating in the bunker. There's uh, 150, 200 bodies in here, all generating body heat. Uh, <coughs> certainly never any need for heating. In fact, there was need for cooling. Uh, uh, equipment needed to be cooled. Uh, so we've got chillers in here. Um, there's two chillers. Number one chiller, number two chiller. And another fan, so the air comes into this room. It's pumped through uh, the trunking into these chillers. Uh, and then out through the trunking again and spread out uh, through the bunker. Right, we're going to go downstairs. There's three ways down to the lower level. Each of them are fitted with a blast door like this. So the lower level could have been completely sealed off uh, from the upper level, which itself was safe, uh, but it's even safer down below. Unfortunately, the doors have now been removed, but there's a similar bunker to this in Oxgate Lane, uh, just off Edgware Road in Cricklewood, uh, and that still has its blast doors still in place. Well, the door's airtight as well. Uh, doors are airtight and a gas seal. Um, if anyone doesn't fancy the, the spiral, it's uh, quite narrow. Church, stand along. Uh, One more. Yeah. Yeah. Right, at this point, we're 38 feet below ground. Um, between us and the floor above there's five feet of solid reinforced concrete and between the upper floor uh, and uh, soil and gravel above that there's another four feet of reinforced concrete and then soil and gravel up to the surface so 38 feet below ground at this point the bunker was supposed to be able to withstand a direct hit from the largest high explosive bomb that the Germans could deliver uh, at the time uh, we had better bombs. We had the tall boy, uh, which would have penetrated uh, a bunker like this. But the, the Germans had nothing uh, that could have touched this. In the nuclear age, of course, a bunker like this would be a waste of time. Uh, even a small Hiroshima-sized atomic bomb dropped on this bunker, it would just be a hole in the ground. Everybody would be dead. A hydrogen bomb, well, not worth thinking about. But at, uh, at that time, in 1939, when the bunker was built, this was secure you'd be safe here. When we first came into this bunker uh, five years ago, the water on the lower level uh, was about two feet deep. Um, and we came into this room, we could see it was a plant room, uh, but we didn't know there might have been holes in the floor. Uh, the water was jet black, it stank of uh, diesel, uh, it was a nasty environment to be in. So we had to wade through it, uh, survey and photograph all the rooms. Um, but now uh, we've got it pumped out so that we can allow all of you in. Now somebody asked me earlier about power for the bunker. Uh, for most of its time the bunker would run off the mains, but the, in the event of a mains failure, for whatever reason, it had to have its own power supply, and that's what we see here. This is the standby generator. Um, it looks quite small, um, but uh, there wasn't a vast amount of power needed. Uh, there was no heating, and it's, uh, it's heating really that takes uh, a lot of uh, energy. Uh, so this was able to run the equipment and the lighting uh, quite adequately. Uh, so this is the standby generator. Uh, that's the uh, control cabinet for the generator. On the wall there, that black box is a battery charger 
that charged the battery that would have started the generator up. Uh, just like you have a battery uh, starting a car, had a battery to start the generator. Behind we've got uh, a couple more chiller cabinets uh, and more ventilation plant equipment. There's another fan over there. So this again is pumping a clean supply of cool air through all the rooms uh, into the bunker. Right, if you let me out, we'll go along to uh, one of, uh, an operations room. Often it's a two-level room uh, with a balcony with people looking down onto the map tables and people pushing tanks around with sticks. Uh, if you've been to the Battle of Britain uh, operations room at RAF Uxbridge, uh, you'll have seen the room there, which is much as I've just described. This is the equivalent room, but here the maps weren't on a table on the floor, they were actually on the walls. They would have been mainly on this wall, and if you look at uh, the fluorescent light fittings, they've got angled shades, so they can actually angle the light, direct the light, onto the maps on the walls. And you might think that fluorescent lighting uh, is something more recent, but certainly fluorescent lighting is around in the 1930s, so all the lighting in this room is contemporary. It would have been a busy room. This is the military uh, command centre. The war in Europe and elsewhere would have been run from this room. Only in the event of Whitehall becoming unusable. So the room was never actually used for that purpose. You notice there are three offices with windows. One from the Admiral Admiralty, one for the Air Ministry and one for the Army. Uh, so they could actually look into the room, see the maps, but they didn't actually need to be in here. And uh, that door there, uh, you'll see it's got a bit of wood missing. It's not a wooden panel that's fallen out, it's actually a message hatch. So that anyone who needed to pass a message from the adjoining office to this room would just pass it through that hatch and it would save them coming in. In those days, the, the way of passing messages around was either by a message hatch or by a series of runners. Uh, you would have someone whose sole job was to run from one room to another, perhaps between the levels, uh, with various messages. Uh, that was the, the He came to the bunker twice. I've already said he didn't like the idea of government moving out of London, and he didn't see the need for a bunker. <coughs> and in fact, in his memoirs, uh, written in 1955, he describes Paddock as far from the light of day. Uh, and he describes it as being somewhere near Hampstead. Uh, so he was either economical with the truth, uh, there was no reason to be in 1955, the, the bunker had been disused for many years. Uh, so it's more likely perhaps he, he took so little interest in it uh, that he didn't really remember where it was. He said he only came here twice. Uh, he came during its uh, construction phase uh, where he saw that the bunker uh, could perhaps fulfil its function. And then on the 3rd of October 1940, he chaired a cabinet, a war cabinet meeting in this bunker. We're going to move along now. And it, most, most of it comes from uh, the stairs where you came in. Yeah. In times of uh, rain, you can actually see it pouring out of holes in the wall. So it just finds its way down onto the lower level. It, it doesn't come in at this level, it comes in at the top. I see. Right, this is the cabinet office. Um, if you've been to the uh, cabinet war rooms at Storys Gate, you'll have seen there one uh, there. This one's somewhat different. Uh, again, you'll see uh, angled shades on some of the fluorescent fittings. So there would have been maps on the wall. Um, who's playing Churchill today? You are. That's where Churchill would have sat. He, he would have sat in the middle of that side of the room, the table facing the door. And he chaired uh, the War Cabinet on the uh, 3rd of October 1940. Uh, he never came back, but uh, the following year he decided that once again the bunker should be tried out. When they came in 1940, it was not because they needed to, it was just to try it out to see if it was able to fulfil its function. And the following March, March the 10th, 1941, he decided it should be tried out again. Uh, on this occasion he wasn't there, the, uh, the cabinet was chaired by the Lord Privy Seal, Clement Attlee. Uh, and one of the uh, reasons for bringing the cabinet back was because the Australian Premier Robert Menzies was visiting the country at the time and uh, it was decided that it uh, might impress him uh, if we showed him the kind of facilities that we had available. Um, so Menzies came along, addressed the War Cabinet for 40 minutes on the Australian-New Zealand war effort and I'm sure was suitably impressed by uh, the underground protective facilities uh, that we had available. 
in uh, more recent times, uh, Attlee's grandson, the present Lord Attlee, uh, came here at our invitation and uh, he spent two hours touring the bunker with us and uh, gave us uh, a lot of uh, information uh, about his uh, grandfather and he was very impressed uh, with the bunker itself and uh, interested to see another part of his family's history. Before Paddock was even completed, the government decided that they must <coughs> bring the standby accommodation closer to London. Uh, so although the bunker here in Dollis Hill was available for use, they were already working on a new site. And the new site was in Marsham Street, South West 1. Uh, two gas holders had been disused since the 1930s uh, and they were removed leaving two large circular holes in the ground uh, and in those holes two new three-story bunkers were built one and a half stories above ground one and a half stories below ground they were known as the north and south rotunda uh, and in 1943 uh, the standby cabinet war room was relocated to the North Rotunda and was given the code name Anson. Now I should perhaps have told you how uh, the bunker got its code name of Paddock. Um, it's not actually recorded, uh, but it's certainly known that in the uh, early part or the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, Tattersalls had racing stables here known as the Wilston Paddocks. Uh, when they were cleared uh, in the early 20th century for housing, uh, they were re remembered with Paddock Road. Uh, and it has been suggested uh, that the code name for the bunker here, Paddock, was taken from Paddock Road. Uh, it's probably not true. Uh, the normal uh, procedure for allocating code names uh, to bunkers uh, was to take the next one in line from a book of code names. Uh, so it's more likely that Paddock was just the next line, the next name in the book. And that's how the bunker was given its name. Anyway, in 1943, uh, Churchill moved all his furniture out into Anson and Paddock was put on care and maintenance. Uh, a skeleton staff was kept here until 1944 uh, when the bunker was completely abandoned and sealed off uh, from uh, uh, the rest of the post office research station site, which of course throughout the war was doing very important uh, government research into code breaking uh, with uh, Colossus and Tommy Flowers uh, and then the work carried on uh, at Bletchley Park. Right, if you'd like to move out of the cabinet war hall and see if you can tell me what you think the room might have been used for. This man here, what he said? Give, give, give him a prize. What did he say? He said broadcasting. It's a BBC studio. How could you tell that? It's uh, acoustic tiles on the walls. Now, all government bunkers, both during the war and since the war, have had studios. The Prime Minister or any of the War Cabinet could have broadcast to the nation from this room uh, had the bunker been sealed down and had he needed uh, to make a broadcast. So this would have been a BBC studio. In all the modern Cold War bunkers, the regional seats of government, the regional government headquarters, they've all had BBC staff and the BBC studio. And that's what that little room was. Right, we've got another narrow spiral staircase. If you didn't like the first one, you won't like this one because it's identical just at the other end of the bunker. Uh, follow me up if you want to go up the main stairway, speak to uh, Ian and uh, he'll take you up the wide. <laughs> it's interesting to know, as the cold form of the rest, the difference is 20-foot wall, 17-foot wall, 10-foot wall, 10-foot The importance of this room is over there. A bunker has to communicate with the outside world. So all the cables, power cables, communications, phone cables, everything comes in through there. You can see all the bitumen seal uh, where they come through the, the outer wall of the bunker. All the cables would have uh, come around this wall. There's hangers there. They would have hung on those hangers along this wall 
and through the slot in the wall into the adjacent room where we'll go now. What's that unit called? Right, this is the main telephone exchange in this room. And this unit here is not a wine rack. There was no need to have a wine rack in a bunker. Well, you might think there was, but uh, Churchill probably uh, had his secret stash somewhere. Uh, but it certainly wasn't in this room. This is the MDF, the main distribution frame. All the incoming phone lines come into this unit here. There's more exchange equipment uh, in this room here. And then they are diverted or switched into the various rooms throughout the bunker. If you'd like to come round to the other side of it, equipment. This switches the telephone lines to the various rooms in the bunker. There's some interesting lettering. 54 pairs to MDF from the sub-basement. 54 pairs of telephone cables to another one of these on the floor below. And again, 100 pairs to the MDF on the sub-basement. But perhaps the most interesting lettering is right down here, on this little unit here. And it's just the letters CWR, Cabinet War Room. Now we don't know that's what it stands for, but this was a Cabinet War Room, and it seems more than likely uh, that that was the actual the switching the relays, switching the lines to the Cabinet War Room on the floor below. Right, if you'd like to move back into the, uh, the uh, that's the bar. And certainly, uh, the the slot in the wall is certainly post-war. And I can, uh, I can see the barman there pouring me a pint of warm red barrel, if anyone remembers that. It was a delicious drink. Not. Uh, so the suggestion was that this uh, was uh, the social club. You see they put in a lowered ceiling. Again, all 1950s. Um, probably not a bar. We know they had a recording studio here. It's probably more than likely that that was a glass window and the engineer was sitting with his panel, with his uh, desk uh, behind the glass and something was being recorded in here. Uh, they certainly had other activities going on. Uh, there was table tennis, uh, there was judo and various other social activities. Uh, but the post office also maintained laboratories uh, on this floor and they used a lot of the rooms for storage. Uh, we don't know if they used any of the lower floor, probably not. Uh, but they certainly had some uh, experimental laboratories uh, on, on this level of the floor. Right, we have another poser for you. It might have been used for. And the evidence, watch the, uh, the trip hazard in the middle. There's a cup to, uh, to show you where it is. Uh, the evidence in this room is the floor. That tells you what this room might have been used for. And can I ask you to shout loud, because I've got bunged up ears and I can't hear you otherwise. What? Pantry. Battery or a pantry? Pantry. Pantry. No, no, it wasn't a pantry. It would make one. Pantry. Refectory. No, no. Uh, no, no, we'll see that in a minute. No. 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 Medical room. Medical, no, 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 no operations uh, were undertaken in the bunker. This was the battery room. Um, telephone equipment, exchange equipment, always runs from batteries, not from the mains. Uh, so they would have had two uh, sets of lead acid accumulators here, similar to car batteries. Uh, one set would have been in use and the other set would have been in char on charge. There would have been uh, battery chargers here as well. Reason for the tiles, uh, lead acid batteries have a tendency to fall over. Sulfuric acid on the shag pile, not a good idea. So Darlington tiles, much better. You can clean it off, doesn't leave a lasting stain. And at the back of the room, you'll see an old sink. So that would have been plumbed into the, uh, uh, the pipes which are behind it. Uh, so if there was a spill, you could uh, mop it up quite quickly. Right, uh, the doorway. Uh, that one's original, this uh, is a, a later addition, so there was never a, a way through into this room. <laughs> Empty rooms that we know exactly what happened in here, and the reason is because the, one of the people who was working in this room in the 1940s actually came on one of these tours last open house weekend. Uh, she, was, she was a telephonist, so we know that this was the telephonist room. Uh, lots of switchboards here, all the telephonists worked in this room. Um, we thought, ah, someone who worked in the bunker is going to be able to tell us all about what went on in all the other rooms. Sadly, no. She came down the stairs, walked into this office, sat at her switchboard, did her job, went home again at the end of the day. She hadn't a clue what went on in, in the next door office, let alone on the lower floor. 
Uh, in those days, you, you did your job, you didn't ask anything else, and that way you get your job, and you didn't get uh, carted off to me. So if we pass through the... Uh, to <laughs> that is a very good suggestion, and that's what I had in mind. No. No toilets. No. Uh, the bunker had no toilets. Well, it did have toilets. Of course it had toilets. They were on the floor above. Not a lot of use if the bunker is sealed down. Uh, nowhere to, to go. Um, I'm sure Churchill probably had a, a chemical toilet in Elson, uh, but for the rest of the people down here, uh, probably hang on for two days or use a fire bucket or something like that. What else isn't there here? Um, no restrooms somewhere to sit. Canteen? Canteen, no canteen, no dormitories. Um, obviously people need to sleep, uh, but the dormitories were elsewhere. Um, Churchill and the higher up uh, government and military staff uh, were given a block of flats in Dollis Hill Lane. Neville's Court was built in 1939 and that was commandeered for war use. Uh, two flats were knocked into one, uh, strengthened and that was Churchill's uh, private accommodation. Um, but it's 300 yards down the road, so not a lot of use uh, if the bunker is under attack and sealed down. Uh, Churchill might have had a camp bed, probably not a use, he might have laid on it and it would have collapsed, probably. <laughs> Much the same if I did it. Uh, so, no sleeping accommodation here at all. Um, the rest of the staff were billeted in local schools. No canteen. Canteen was upstairs. They used the post office research station canteen. Uh, so again, a uh, bit of a problem if the bunker is sealed down. But they did have a very small kitchen. No mess rooms. So if you wanted to, uh, to eat, you just ate on the move. Um, there would have been a, a basic cooker here, a couple of old butler sinks which would grace anyone's house these days if you uh, do them up. Uh, but uh, it was never expected that anyone would be here for that long. A um, couple of days. Uh, they weren't expecting uh, to be bombed. What was more likely was that it was going to be a gas attack and that's why you had to be sealed into the bunker. We thought we'd found some World War II rations there, a couple of cans. But I noticed it's caustic soda, so I doubt if that would have been a lot of use. And the R White's bottle down there is uh, probably 1960s, so I don't think that was what they were drinking either. So, a very basic kitchen, um, probably uh, adequate, but, but no more. Regional uh, authorities, <coughs> local county uh, borough councils all had bunkers, the police had bunkers, the railways had bunkers, the water companies had bunkers, gas and electricity, everybody had bunkers. Um, so surely a use could have been found for this bunker. I've already said it was no use whatsoever for a nuclear attack. A direct hit uh, from an atom bomb, this would be a hole in the road. Uh, a direct hit from a hydrogen bomb, everything would be a hole in the ground for a mile or so around. But it would have provided uh, protection from radiation. Um, there was certainly a proposal to use this bunker in the 1950s. Uh, Post-war, uh, it was decided to build a series of bunkers to run London in the event of a nuclear attack. These were known as regional war rooms. Uh, four of them were built, uh, one at Chislehurst, one at Cheam, one at Mill Hill and one at Wanstead for southwest, southeast, northwest, northeast London. Uh, later the Chislehurst one was closed and moved to London Road in Crystal Palace underneath a block of flats and a fifth one was added at Southall. What was needed was a central bunker that all these bunkers would report to, a controlling bunker for the network of war rooms. And it was suggested that this would be suitable, uh, but in the event it was decided to uh, use the North Rotunda, uh, the former Anson bunker in Martian Street. Uh, so this bunker didn't find a reuse uh, in the 1950s. Again, it was considered for use by Ken Livingston in the 1980s. Uh, at that time, the uh, the North London War Room, Partingdale Lane, Mill Hill, had been taken out of use because it was damp and unsuitable. Uh, so they came here to see if this uh, would be a suitable uh, replacement. But unfortunately this was even damper. Uh, and Ken Livingston threw the uh, proposal out. He wasn't that keen on bunkers anyway. Uh, but the government of the time, the Thatcher government, insisted it was law that every local authority had bunkers. Um, so the bunker never got any further use. Um, once the post office moved out in 
uh, the late 1960s, Schweppes moved onto the site, and for a few years uh, it was their headquarters. Uh, we don't think they used the bunker for anything at all. They moved out and the whole site became the Dollis Hill Industrial Estate. And in fact, part of it is still the Dollis Hill Industrial Estate, although that's about to be closed and the remaining building uh, on that site is going to become a school. We'll keep the building. Uh, but the rest of the, uh, the uh, Dollis Hill site, the Post Office Research Station, uh, was redeveloped in the late 1990s by the Network Housing Association uh, for housing. The main post office research station building, which is a grade two listed building, was converted to luxury flats. That still stands now. Uh, some of the other buildings, uh, including the surface building of this, uh, were demolished and there's now uh, new housing along uh, Brook Road, standing on top of the, uh, the original buildings. When Network took over the site uh, from Brent Council, uh, one of the conditions uh, that they took on the site was that the bunker was retained. It doesn't have any real listing other than local authority listing, which isn't worth a light. Uh, but the council were keen that it should be retained, and uh, when Network bought the site, it was on the understanding uh, that they uh, cleared out the bunker, put in lighting, and they opened it up on at least two days per year, which they have done. They fulfilled their obligation very well. Uh, they've spent a lot of money pumping out the bunker, putting the lighting in, uh, arranging for contractors to come in before each open day to uh, clean the place, hoover the, hoover the floor. <laughs> Literally, they do hoover the floor. They have a vacuum cleaner that sucks up water. Uh, so they come in and they hoover up all the water which gathers on the floor. It's never more than an inch or so. Uh, on this level, on the lower level, we sweep it into the sumps and it's pumped away. So, Network uh, have, uh, have done very well, fulfilling their obligation to open the bunker. We open up uh, in the spring, midweek in the spring one day, and on the Saturday of open house weekend in September, which is why you're all here now. That concludes the tour. Does anyone have any questions? Just a little one. Why are those original signs? Ah, the signs. Day. Right. Floor 28, upstairs. Floor 26. It's actually the one downstairs, and this is floor 27. It's a very strange numbering system uh, that the post office used at all their sites. All floors of all buildings are consecutively numbered. So one three-storey building might be floor 7, 8 and 9. Uh, the building next to it might be 10, 11 and 12. It just so happens that this three-storey building is 26, 27 and 28. So, unfortunately, it doesn't mean there's another 25 floors below us. It would be very nice if there was, uh, but sadly, no. Right, if you'd like to go up the surface, so we can ask some more questions on the surface, can I ask you to keep your hard hats on until you get out, and then hand them in to one of the helpers, and also as you go out of the door, hand in your wristband to Joan. If anyone wants any leaflets about Paddock and about Subterranean Britannica, uh, tells you about our superb website, then please ask when we get up to the surface, and we'll give you a, a colour leaflet.